So let me ask you this morning, have you ever been scared? I'm not talking about being startled. You know, somebody walks in on you and you're startled. I'm not talking about being momentarily frightened. I'm talking about being truly scared, of, of having fear of the future, of the unknown, of what was going on in your life. I, I have to confess, and today I want to be extremely transparent, I have to confess that the last few weeks I've experienced some, some personal fear. Whether you know or not, so two weeks ago today I left, and in the afternoon I was experiencing some chest pains, and so, so went to the hospital, and I found out I had two blockages, um, over 90%, one of them 99.9%, and so they went in and had three stents put in. Um, so if you know my history, that's not the first time I'd had a heart attack when I was 36 and triple bypass open heart surgery, and five years ago I had a heart attack, and they went in and put a stent in, and so this was like the third or the fourth uh, step in this entire process. I was released from the hospital on Wednesday, and I want you to know inside I had this uncertainty, I had this, I had this fear. I was scared. I'm like, okay, God, how many times is this going to happen to me, and when is it going to happen to a degree that they don't catch it? So I was at home worrying and fearful for two or three days, and and then on Friday of that week, I felt like I was experiencing some more pain, so they put me back in the hospital, and I was in the hospital all last weekend. I was in the hospital for three days, and thankfully, they went through and did all kinds of tests, did a stress test, and my heart is in good shape. It was, it was fear, it was anxiety that gripped a hold of me. And I repeatedly quoted 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 where, where Paul says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I wish I could tell you that there was this catharsis moment in which I, I won the victory and from that moment on uh, I was not afraid and I was not fearful. Uh, that's not the case. I still feel a twinge and I think, oh no, is it coming again? For me, fear is an ongoing battle. Tim Wagner, who's a member of our church here at HCC and a life group leader, was diagnosed with cancer in 2014. And uh, Tim sent me an email this week. He knew we were preaching on this passage. And as a result of that diagnosis, Tim was faced with a wave of emotions, including fear of the future. Be, being a person who grew up in the church, Tim is a pastor's son. He knew that the answer to fear was to simply trust God, right? When we're scared, what do we do? We simply trust God. But there's a big difference between knowing the answer and living the answer. Tim said this, and I want to quote Tim. He says, as much as I tried I, find, I found myself feeling guilty that I was still struggling with fear. And I struggled with fear until another brother in Christ who, who, who God sent into my life, who had experienced the same cancer seven years before, reminded me, Tim says, of a passage of Scripture. He reminded me of Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, in which Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he faced his crucifixion, his crucifixion, prayed this, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In modern language, Jesus was simply saying, God, is there any other plan? Is there any other way? Do I have to go through this? And as we'll see in the passage today, Jesus experienced from a human perspective the same fear and anxiety that Tim experienced and the same fear and anxiety that Brian experienced this past week. Today's message is profoundly theological, but it's also extremely, extremely practical for each of us. Because you see in Mark chapter 14, what we're going to read in just a few moments is just as if God opens up the curtains and he gives us a glimpse 
of the humanity of Jesus Christ. And as we see Jesus' humanity, we see that fear is a natural emotion. It's an emotion that God has created. And I want you to know that, that when Jesus prayed that prayer to God the Father, God, if there's any way that I don't have to go through this, please let this cup pass from me. God wasn't disappointed in Jesus. His response to Jesus was not, come on, where's your faith? Suck it up. Do what you've been called to do. That's not the way that God responded to him. Uh, As a matter of fact, we find, I believe, Jesus' example, his prayer here in Mark chapter 14, as an example to us of how we can honestly and transparently go to God in prayer. So if you have your Bibles with me today, we're in Mark chapter 14, as I mentioned. We could have read Matthew, we could have read Luke. This is found in all three of the synoptic gospels. But Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 32. It says this, and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to the disciples, sit here while I pray. So, so remember, Brad spoke last week on, on, on the upper room and the Last Supper, and so as they concluded all of that, they, they left the upper room and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and as they arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says to the group of the disciples, sit here while I go and pray. Verse 33, he takes with him Peter, James, and John. And Jesus begins to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed, if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. And he said this, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Notice this phrase, if you underline in your Bibles, you ought to underline this phrase, yet not what I will, but what you will. Father, if it's possible, let this cup, the suffering pass from me, but it's not what I want, it's what you want. And so Jesus then left and came and found them sleeping and said to them, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You probably experienced that this morning when the alarm went off, right? The spirit was willing, but the flesh wanted to stay in bed. And Jesus left again and went away and prayed the same words. And he came back again, and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time to them and said, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? If you follow me on Facebook, that was the quote that I put on this morning on Facebook. Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Wake up, it's time for church this morning. (laughs) Jesus tells them, it is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we're so grateful to be in your house this morning. Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of your people that, Lord, I I know it's only one hour, but Lord, that's difficult. Time change Sunday's difficult. I'm so thankful that they made the effort to be here today. And God, I pray that you would reward their effort by sensing your presence. Lord, thank you for the time of worship and thank you that you are a good God, so much better to us than we could ever, ever deserve. But thank you that you're not only a good God to us, you're a transparent God to us. Thank you for the example that you have given us to follow. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to not only understand the theological implications of the passage that we're studying today, but even more importantly, Father, I pray that you would help us to apply those to our lives. Help us to come to a place in our life, whatever we're facing, that we can pray like Jesus, not my will, but your will be done. And Lord, as we pray that, I pray that you would give us an inner peace and a joy even in the midst of the struggles that we are going through. I do pray if there's somebody here today that does not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that today would be the day that they would open up their heart and by faith they would embrace the finished work of Jesus Christ. So God, do a work in our hearts and we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.
So once again, the Passover supper has been eaten. Jesus has concluded his upper room discourse that's, that's recorded in the Gospel of John, including the high priestly prayer that's found in John chapter 17. The disciples have uh, sung a hymn together, and they left the upper room, and they crossed the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, and they made their way to a very familiar spot. They made their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is a place whose name literally means olive press. It's located on the slope of the Mount of Olives. I think we have a picture that, that we can put up if that's in the, in the PowerPoint. It's located on the slope of the Mount of Olives just across the Kidron Valley from the city of Jerusalem. It's a beautiful garden with trees. If you look, there's trees that date back thousands of years. And the trees that are in the Garden of Gethsemane today are more than likely the sons and the daughters of the trees that were there when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's an, incre an incredibly quiet and serene and peaceful place. We had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to visit there several years ago. But in, in, in Mark chapter 14, in, in the passage that we're studying today, the Garden of Gethsemane was not a place of peace for Jesus. As a matter of fact, it was a place of unbelievable struggle. And so I've given you two simple uh, 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 points in your outline today. The first is this, simply the horrors of Gethsemane. Because as Jesus was there in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, realizing what was going to take place in just a few hours, that place that had been for him a spiritual refuge now became a place of spiritual battle. Although he regularly went there to pray and spend time with the Father, and he enjoyed his time there, on this day, Gethsemane would not be a peaceful place. Jesus would experience one of the darkest hours of his life, and Jesus would fight one of the greatest spiritual battles that he ever had to fight. And by the way, he would do it all alone. And so I, I mentioned three things in your outline. If you, if you have it in front of you and you're taking notes, the first is this, that, that in this time of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, we find Jesus agonizing over his pending suffering and death. As a matter of fact, I want you to go back and, and look at just a few verses with me in the passage. In verse 33, it says this. It says, and Jesus began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Verse 34 says this, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. And if you're familiar with Luke's account, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 24, 22 and verse 44, he says that Jesus prayed being in such agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became just like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, if you think that Luke is using a metaphor there, that he's not talking about something that really happened, that's simply not true. Jesus prayed with such agony that blood mingled with his sweat. That's an actual medical condition, something that took place in Jesus' body as he passionately prayed to the Father. And so the first thing we see is in this time of prayer, hours before his crucifixion, we see Jesus agonizing over what he was about to experience. And so we ask ourselves the question, what was Jesus agonizing over? I mean, wasn't he God? Wasn't he all-powerful? Wasn't he omniscient? Wasn't he omnipotent? What would he be agonizing over? What would he be sorrowful for? And the text is very clear. The next thing I wrote in our outline simply is this. Jesus asked the Father, if possible, to not drink from the cup. Several times here in Mark chapter 14 and several times in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus asked that now very familiar request of the Father. Father, if it's possible, if, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. The question theologians have asked for years is simply this, what was in the cup? <laughs> If Jesus said, let this cup pass from me, what was in the cup? What was he asking the Father to allow him to avoid? Was it the fear of physical suffering? Was it the fear 
of dying? Or was it something more metaphysical? Was it something more mystical? I say two things in your outline, and I want you to catch this. Wade with me through this theological part, and, and we'll get to the practical part. Because the cup represented much more than just the fear of human suffering catch that because sometimes we sit back and we think, boy, with everything Jesus was going to experience, he was was afraid of, of the physical abuse that he was about to receive. Now, follow me. (laughs) To fear death at the hand of the Romans was completely understandable. The, The Romans had perfected crucifixion. To to the Romans, it wasn't just a means of execution. The purpose of crucifixion to the Romans was not just to kill their victim. Crucifixion was a means of torture. And they literally tried to keep their victim alive as long as they possibly could so that that victim would experience as much pain as was humanly possible. Any person would have feared such death. But I submit to you today that the cup that Jesus asked the Father to remove signified much more than just physical suffering, even though that was completely plausible. The second thing I say is this, the cup represented God's wrath against the sin of the world. You see, as Jesus was saying, Father, if there's any way, is there another plan? Is there another way that we can accomplish the exact same purpose? He wasn't just trying to avoid the physical pain, but he realized that within a few hours, he himself would bear the sins of the world. Your sins and my sins, Peter says, on his own body or in his own body, on the tree, he would experience that. And as the result of carrying your sin and my sin and everyone's sin here, he himself would be the recipient of the wrath of God. You see, throughout the Old Testament, that that phrase, cup of wrath or cup of the wine of God's wrath, is used over and over and over again, speaking of God's judgment against sin and speaking of God's judgment against sinful people. Here's just a few examples in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 7. The prophet says, wake yourself, wake yourself. Boy, for some reason that's a theme this morning on this Sunday, is it not? Wake up, wake up, stand up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk from the hand of the Lord. Notice what it says, the cup of staggering, the cup of his wrath is what it means. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 15, thus the Lord, the God of Israel said to me, take from my hand this cup of the wine of the wrath of God and make all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And so when God the Father describes his wrath towards the wickedness of mankind, he talks about what? He talks about the cup of the wine of his wrath. And so Jesus, fully understanding that Old Testament concept, as he prays to the Father, he says, if it's possible, let this cup, the cup of your wrath against mankind, let it be removed from me. Here's what I want you to catch, and this is so deep and so profound. You're you're a theological group today, and so catch this. You see, the suffering at the hand of the Romans was child's play in comparison to the suffering at the hands of an almighty God. And Jesus knew that. In order for Jesus to pay the full and complete price for our sin, he would need to endure the weight of sin, not just the sin of the people of his generation, but the sins of all the world. He would need to endure the weight of sin. He would need to endure the punishment, God's wrath towards that evil. He would need to endure the suffering of hell. And as Jesus prayed there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he realized what awaited him in the next few hours, and his prayer simply was this, man, Dad, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I love N.T. Wright's description of this. N.T. Wright says this, speaking of Jesus, saying, he, he had looked into the darkness 
And he saw the grinning faces of all the demons of the world looking back at him. And he begged and he begged his father not to bring him to the point of going through with it. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Man, if, if we paused right there, we could fully understand the emotion and the pain and the suffering of Jesus. But here's what I want you to catch in the passage. Although Jesus asked for an escape, he was fully ready to fulfill whatever God's will was for his life. And so he says, God, if it's possible, let this cup from me, but not what I want but what you want. May your will be done. Aren't you glad today that Jesus submitted to the will of God the Father? Aren't you glad today that he willingly sacrificed himself for us in spite of the suffering, physical and spiritual, that he had to endure? He paid the price for us and so, so the last thing that I wrote in my outline under that point is this. Jesus obediently submitted to the will of the Father. Even though it wasn't necessarily from a human perspective what he wanted to go through. And listen, I get the whole theological implications. He was 100% God. He was 100% man. I believe that the idea to die on the cross was determined in the decrees of God before the foundation of the world. Before Jesus ever came, he knew that he came to die. I get all of that. But here, God allows us to pull back the curtains and see the humanity of our Savior as Jesus experiences what you and I experience on a regular basis, the fear, the the agony, the sorrow, the despair. And yet in the midst of all of that, he says, but God, at the end of the day, it's not what I'm asking. It's not what I want, but your will should be done. I love how the writer of Hebrews describes this scene. You've probably read these verses before, but they've never resonated with you relating to the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Notice Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. The writer of Hebrews says this, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his, because of his reverence. I love verse eight. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So here we find God the Son obediently submitting to the will of God the Father and as a result paying the price for our sin. So follow back to the text. So here's what's taking place. Three times Jesus goes and prays. Three times he comes back to the disciples and he finds them sleeping. And we don't even have a lot of time today to talk about the reaction of the disciples. But isn't their reaction typical for us? <laughs> Here we find Jesus going through this unbelievable moment of spiritual struggle. And what are Peter, James, and John doing? They're sleeping. It says their eyes were so heavy that they couldn't even keep their eyes open. Jesus is fighting this spiritual battle and because of the weakness of the disciples, they are not fighting with him. So three times he, he comes back to the Father, and three times he cries out the same request to the Father each time. I really want you to catch this point, okay? And then we're going to move on. I want you to see in Luke chapter 22 and verse 43, Luke gives us a tidbit that is not found in the other synoptic gospels. Luke gives us a tidbit that is so real and palpable for us. So here's Jesus praying. He prayed once. He prayed twice. He prayed three times. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Not, yet not what I will, what, but what you will. Luke twenty two forty three 43 says, And there appeared in, to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. So here's Jesus in this moment of of human weakness, divine strength, but human weakness, crying out to God in despair, in agony, in sorrow. And God the Father sends an angel to strengthen 
him. The text doesn't tell us what the angel says. I love how R.C. Sproul characterizes this. R.C. Sproul says this, that the angel came from heaven with the Father's answer to Jesus' prayer. And the angel comes and simply says this to Jesus, you must drink the cup. You must drink the cup. Here's what I want you to see. At that moment, the internal battle was over. Whenever Jesus realized from a human perspective what was the will of his Father, the battle was over. Jesus gets up from Gethsemane. You know the rest of the story. We're going to be talking about it in the next few weeks. Jesus gets up from, this, from Gethsemane. Never one more time do we see him shaking. Never one more time do we see him doubting. As he was flogged, he never cried out to God saying, God, please don't do this to me. As they nailed his hands to the cross, he never cried out saying, God, please, is there another way? As they dropped that cross in the ground and all of his bones were dislocated, he never questioned God. From the moment that he knew what God's will was, he was focused on accomplishing God's will. And he went with purpose, and he went with determination, and he went with resolution to the cross to accomplish God's will, your salvation, and mine. One author said it this way, I love this. The devil was destroyed at Calvary, but he was defeated at Gethsemane. Because at Gethsemane, the battle was over. The battle was won. Calvary was essential, but it was also now inevitable. Jesus had won the victory. When he left the Garden of Gethsemane, the victory was already won. Because he knew what he needed to accomplish for our salvation, and he was determined to do it. God, not what I want, what you want. May your will be done. I find it interesting how we de-emphasize Gethsemane. And I believe with all of my heart, Gethsemane was the D-day of our salvation. Jesus fought that spiritual battle, and he won the spiritual battle for us. And today we look back in all of our worship songs. We talk about God is good, and we talk about the fact that we're forgiven, and we talk about the fact that heaven is ours, and we talk about the fact that we're redeemed. All of that is possible because Jesus came to the place where he said, God, not what I want, but what you want. I am willing to submit myself to your will. Something so horrific And by the way, you and I might have moments of struggle in our life, but you will never have to go through Gethsemane in your life. You know why that is? Because Jesus won the victory in Gethsemane. And you don't need to have a Gethsemane moment in your life. So let me show you, having said that, let me show you three other things. And I know I say that it might sound like I'm contradictory, but follow me along. So the first thing I show is the horrors of Gethsemane. The other thing I want you to see is this, the lessons from Gethsemane. So as we, as we look at this incredibly intimate moment between God the Son, and, and, and think of what is taking place here. You have God bese- beseeching God. All right, so God the Son is beseeching God the Father to, uh, to, to, to find out what his will is, something incredibly intimate. But what are the practical lessons for you and I? Let me mention three things, and I trust this will be practical for you today, and we'll be done. The first is this. Like Jesus, you will have nights of agony and despair. Not to the extent that he did, not a Gethsemane moment, but you and I will have nights of agony and despair. I really want you to catch this. Because I, I, I'm afraid, and you guys realize I, I say very little about Christian television, but we are bombarded on Christian television with the fact that once you trust Christ, all of your problems are going to be over. You don't ever have to be sick again. You don't ever have to have any financial problems again. And that is not found in Scripture. It's not. As a believer, like Jesus, you will have times of agony and despair salvation does not free you from suffering. You will experience times of agony, despair, pain, 
and suffering in your life. Here's what Jesus said in John 16, He says this, in the world you will have tribulation. That doesn't sound like, uh, like he doesn't know what he's talking about there, does he? He says, you will have tribulation in the world. Now, if the verse stopped right there, we could understand moments of discouragement, but it doesn't. He said, in the world, you will have, be a, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've already overcome the world. And so he doesn't promise that we won't go through struggles, but he does promise us that the ultimate victory is ours and he will be with us. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. You see, as we look at the Garden of Gethsemane, we must realize that like Jesus, we will have moments of agony. We will have moments of despair. We will have moments of sorrow. We will have moments of tribulation in our life. Matt Chandler says this. He says, and this is so powerful. I think we have it on the screen. He says, comfort is the God of our generation. And it is. We could pause right there and preach a message because if we sent you an email today and said, oh, by the way, the air conditioning's off, but we're going to have church anyways, half of us wouldn't come to church this morning. Comfort is the God of our generation. As a result, suffering is seen as a problem to be solved. And so we look at suffering as if, okay, we got to resolve that problem rather than the providence of God for our lives. In other, words, in other words, here's what Matt Chandler's saying. At times, God's will for your life and mine is suffering. At times, God's plan for our life, God's providence for our life is that we go through trials, that we go through tribulations. He does that intentionally for us. So important for us to catch that. You will have moments of despair. You will have moments of, of discouragement. You will have moments of fear in your life. Here's the second lesson that I pulled from this. It's this. Like Jesus, your path to victory is found in obedience to God's will. My path to victory, your path to victory is found in obedience to God's will. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that we don't pray for healing. It doesn't mean that we don't believe that God has the power to heal. It doesn't mean that we don't believe that God can do the impossible. Jesus actually says in the passage, he says, God, you can do the impossible. Remove this cup from me. But at the end of the day, it's not what I want. It's not my plan for my life. Rather, it is your plan for my life. Not what I will, but what you want to be done in my life. So let's assume today that you're going through a struggle. Maybe you're here today and you've just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Maybe you're here today and you've lost a husband or a wife and you're struggling with that, a child and you're struggling with that. Maybe you're here today and you're in the midst of a broken relationship and you're hurt and you're troubled by all of that. Maybe you're going through an unbelievable financial difficulty today. I have no idea what you're struggling with today, but, but let me encourage you to come to a place in your life where you say, okay, God, listen, my, my, my natural tendency is to try to fix this, to try to solve the problem, and there's nothing wrong with that, but God, I want you to know that I've come to the place in my life where I say, it's not what I want, but God, it's what you want. And so, God, if you want me to go through an illness, I'm willing to do that. God, if you want me to go through joblessness, I am willing to do that. Not what I will, but may your will be done. Let me give you three truths. They're not in your notes. I'm going to put them up on the outline today uh, or up on the screen today. I want you to catch this. To pray your will be done is to recognize the sovereignty of God in every aspect of your life. 
When you and I pray, your will be done, we are recognizing that we serve a sovereign God. Sovereignty simply means that God is in control. And whenever we're going through a moment that our world seems out of control, it's so important for us to have something that we can hold on to. And what we should hold on to is the sovereignty of God. God is in control. He knows what he is doing. The second thing is this, to pray your will be done is to recognize that your will must be submitted to his will. Your will, my will, must be submitted to his will. Remember, remember when, when you were in high school or in the youth group and we played tug of war? Anybody remember playing tug of war? You know, tug of war is, a, you know, they take the big rope, you know, and you got one team on one side and you got the other team on the other side and you're pulling, you know, the one team is pulling in one direction and the other team is pulling in the other direction and there's this tug of war that's going on and the strongest team wins. I'm afraid that often in our spiritual lives, we are playing tug of war with God. Because because God has one purpose, one plan, one providence for our life, and we are what? Rather than accepting what God has for us, we we are pulling against God as if he is going to submit to our will. It's almost as if at times we say, God, you know what, man, you are messing this up. (laughs) Man, God, you're... You're messing up my life. Let me tell you how to do it. And when we pray your will is done, we are simply saying, oh God, God, here's what I want to happen. I want to submit my will to your will. Whatever that is, God, I want your will to be done in my life. And listen, this is so important. Once you recognize that your struggle, your sickness, your loss is a part of God's plan, it's at that, at that moment that you can then rest in his care. You can rest in his promises, realizing that his will is better than yours. I would say one third thing to pray your will be done is to realize that God will not spare you from trial and tribulation. We've already talked about that. Rather, he will use the fiery furnace to purge the impurities from your life and for your mind from your mind. Uh, That's why James says this in James chapter 1. My brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you go through different trials and tribulations. Knowing that what? Knowing that the trying of your faith produces patience. Listen, we, we, we learn so much more from God in the waiting room than we do in the bounce house or in the playroom. We want our life to be a life of perfection. We want our life to be a life free of struggles. We want our life to be a life of joy, a party, a constant time of peace without any struggles. But listen to me, you learn more in the struggles than you learn in the blessings. You learn more in the burdens than you do in the blessings. So as James says, we come to a place where we says, God, thank you. Thank you for the trials because you're using the trials to accomplish in my life what only you can accomplish. Let me give you one third thing, and I'm done today. Like Jesus, let me go back. Like Jesus, you will have nights of agony and despair. Like Jesus, your victory and mine is found in obedience to God's will. And like Jesus... Your peace is found in honest and passionate prayer. I love the transparency of Jesus' prayer. Uh, As I've read, I've done a lot of reading on this the last few weeks, and and, and so many people want to paint Jesus in this heroic way. And by the way, he is our hero. In every single way, he is our hero. But but some people want to paint Jesus with the idea that from the moment he was born, he never had any struggles, he never had any trials, he never had any suffering. I mean, he was headed towards the cross without any hesitation whatsoever. And here in Mark chapter 14, God allows us to catch a glimpse of the human struggle of our Savior. And Jesus shows us that you and I can be honest in our prayers. 
We don't have to feign spirituality. We don't have to fake faith. We can come to God in a transparent way and share our fears with him. We can tell him that we're struggling with our faith. We can even ask him, God, change the plan. If there's any way, please change the plan. We can be honest. We can be transparent with him. How do we know that? Because Jesus was. And if Jesus was able to speak to his father with such a transparent and passionate way, then you and I can do the exact same thing. You see, church family, it's in those moments of prayer that our faith is strengthened. And it's in those moments of prayer that we are given the God-given resolve to accept and fulfill his will for our life. I love the words of Robert Law. He made this quote. He simply said, prayer is a mighty instrument, not forgetting man's will done in heaven, but forgetting God's will done here on earth. And prayer, going to him with an open, honest, sincere, broken heart, allows us not only to understand who he is and what, he, what his will is for our life, but it gives us the strength to accomplish it and to fulfill his will. So, so let me ask you today, very, very intimate question. Is there a part of your life that you've held back? Is there a part of your life that you are still in this this divine tug of war with God? And you're saying, listen, no, I don't want that. I'm not going to accept that. I, I want my will, not your will. Let me encourage you today to rest in the example of Jesus. As he simply prayed, God, not my will, but yours be done. And I do find it interesting, and I believe with all of my heart, that if you will come to that place and you will pray that prayer, struggling, saying, God, I I don't even know how I'm going to do this, but today I accept your will, whatever it is. I I sincerely believe that just as an angel was sent from heaven to strengthen Jesus Christ, I believe that God will give you the strength, and I will believe that God will give you the encouragement, and he will give you the ability to go through whatever that struggle is in your life. Would you give it to him? Just give it to him and allow his will to be done in your life. Would you stand with me today? We're going to have a word of prayer. Vicky's going to come and sing a song that kind of ties in with that, talking about resting in God's promise. Man, right where you are, would you just have a personal, intimate moment with God today? Kind of like a Holy Spirit anointed moment with God right now. Is there something with which you are struggling? Something that with which, man, you're just having difficulty accepting. And at times you feel like you're just pushing against God, like you and him are on opposite teams. And let me encourage you to come to a place today where you say, okay, God, not my will but yours be done. I'm going to keep praying that you remove the cup, but God, I want you to know at the end of the day, it's not what I want. It's what you want. May your will be done in my life on earth, just as it is in heaven. Father, thank you so much for the example of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that that he completely fulfilled your plan. Lord, our salvation our redemption, our glorious future is all based upon the fact that he fulfilled the Father's will. Thank you for that. And I pray that you would help us to follow in his example. Help us to rest in your sovereignty. Help us to rest in your will, realizing that your plan is better than ours. Help us to rest in that. Help us to trust in that. There's a person here today that has never by faith trusted Jesus Christ. I pray that today would be the day in their heart that they would confess their sin and and reach out to Jesus, to Jesus alone for their salvation. Lord, do a work in our hearts and our lives. Strengthen us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.